Hello everyone, welcome back to History Surfer. This is Dr. A and today I am doing a lecture on architecture. Of course, this is predominantly for my art appreciation courses, but if you are watching and you find it interesting, you're welcome. We're going to start off with the ideas of how architecture develops. When humans were in their very early stages of development, as many of you already know, they were nomadic. They were hunter-gatherers. And so we don't really consider what they're doing architecture, although it has been termed the architecture of shelter. It was structures that were easily put together and easily taken apart too. Sometimes they even took them with them. Um, think of the um, Plains Indians in North America. Uh, a lot of these were these type of lean-to structures, teepee structures, round huts, and also we see develop a style or a method, I should say, is the more correct, um, that really becomes a foundation for many other things in architecture. Let me back that out so you all can see that and make sure it's focused. All right. This is called post and beam construction. So we have post, post, and beam there at the top. We're very specifically referring to material as this is a terminology used to refer to wood. When Homo sapiens began to settle in the Neolithic period, we see them building this way in the West. It's a very easy method to put together and there are still round huts and everything. Don't get me wrong. It's just we do see this as a one form of construction being used and it would have been easy to throw together and again dominated by the material wood. In architecture one of the things that's easy about it and when I wrote my dissertation I totally you know, focused on architecture is there's only a couple things happening there's very little change and that's driven by material there's only three types of material available wood stone and brick so what you can do with those is what you have at your disposal when humans begin to settle in settlements in the Neolithic period they also, some of them, felt the desire to build something that was more permanent. And so they had to change material from wood. We still see the same post and beam, but now translated into wood, we call this post and lintel construction. Post and lintel construction has a few you know, problems for them as they soon realize the span, so the area in between here and here could not be, really the number is, I remember uh, learning eight feet. Uh, I remember I was in school, architectural historian who taught me that was what he taught me and I haven't seen too many other things that refute that. And it also I think is driven by how large the stone is. This post and lintel construction provided basic architectural form. It becomes the base for building in the western half of the world and we really do in the West look back to the Greeks as the founders of Western architecture. They developed the terminology, it's the language that we're still using in architecture today. I want to focus on the Greeks because of that and the fact that they developed the aesthetic that set up Western architecture. It's also interesting that the Greeks are also, as the founders of Western architecture, criticized and praised for some of the things they did. Uh, oftentimes, I did teach the history of architecture at one point in my teaching career, and uh, Architects don't like to think of architecture as a fine art, but it is. It's in the fine arts. It's unique because it's the only fine art that has function, but it does come from the Greeks because they looked at architecture as a piece of sculpture. There's a couple reasons for that. Uh, post and lintel construction does not lend itself to large interior space. 
And so truly they're working on the out using the outside of the structure. So it had to be aesthetically appealing. Now we look at this temple building here. And instead of saying post, now we can say columns and still the lintels. But in addition, we have a lot of decorative things like metopes up here. I, this is not an architecture class per se. You know, this is just a, an overview. So you don't have to know too many of the technical terms, but just know it's the Greeks who are the founders. I want to talk about the classical or architectural orders today. Both are used. Um, this is what I'm going to, you know, briefly touch on. The classical or architectural order of a structure is determined by this top portion of a column. It is called the capital. When we look at the capital, we can ascertain what that architectural order is. The oldest of the architectural orders is the Doric order. The Doric order is the most robust. It tends to be on larger structures. Think Parthenon. And you can see here the capital is a circular pillow. That's the way I think of it. That's how I was taught that. And it was like slightly squished. Okay, it's very simple. It's very plain. The next order which developed, oops, sorry, was the Ionic order. And the Ionic order has that scroll at the top. That scroll is called a volute. Again, you don't have to know that. It's just a term. And this tends to be a more elegant, smaller column. Although I've seen it used on big buildings. You know, people violate rules and make their own thing all the time. But in the Doric order, excuse me, the Ionic order, we have a, a certain elegance, a refined feeling to it. The next order which came together was the Corinthian order. And the Corinthian order is the most complex. It's the most decorative. It's the one that the Romans favored when they were doing architecture. The Romans were great copiers of the Greek for aesthetics. And certainly they loved the Corinthian order, which had these leaves. These are called the canthus leaves, as well as the scrolls again. Uh, these are buildings that you can easily identify once you know what the order, how to find out what order you're looking at. For example, we look at this structure, we see this is Ionic. This next one, Corinthian. Corinthian columns are very popular in American architecture for government structures. You notice them quite a bit on buildings. Next, we talk, we're going to talk about vaults. Vaults are, as you see here from this definition, uh, what we're talking when we're talking about the vaulting system, it's everything that's used to provide interior space, including the ceiling and the roof. Okay? The vault that was finally successful in spanning great interior space, because the Greeks didn't figure it out, not in stone, but would be the Romans. The rounder Roman arch conquered interior space in the West, if you will. They were great engineers. In addition to the round arch, the Romans also invented concrete. I don't know if you know that, but I mean, they are really good at what they do. This arch allowed for, you stack them and you can create a barrel vault. A barrel vault like this is a very heavy, thick, dark, interior because the vault itself is very heavy and you can have very few openings. You can't lessen the integrity of the wall. The wall is load bearing. And you can see here an example of that. You can see the walls are very thick. Um, you can see that in the embrasures here in the windows and that big dark, heavy, excuse me, vault that the walls have to carry. So these tend to be more compact. Although you get some big vaults, don't, don't think they're all small. But it is a, it's definitely a massive feeling structure. In the east, we see the development of domes as a vaulting system. Um, all the research I've done uh, points to Persia as an origin spot for a dome. A dome is a very elegant top to a building. And if you look at a dome, it's really kind of, uh, you can see it once I point it out. It's really just a arch rotated. 
and these beautiful toppings to structures like the Taj Mahal are definitely a product of that, you know, aesthetic. It's a very lovely way to cap a structure. Uh, think of Washington, D.C., lots of domes. It's very elegant, and so they become quite popular. After the development of the Roman arch, or the round arch, Really, um, it would take quite a while after the fall of Rome for anything new to be invented in architecture. And so now we're talking about the 12th century with the pointed arch, the Gothic arch, um, designed to create a lighter wall, unlike that barrel vault. The Gothic arch, because of the way the weight falls and the way that its weight is captured by flying buttresses, will allow for thinner walls, which allowed for the inclusion of stained glass. It, it's an integral part of the Gothic church because the idea was to help the congregation learn. So really, while it does let light in, and, you know, Shuger, Abu Shuger, who was the inventor of the Gothic arch, um, that was his main point, was light. It was really predominantly eventually seen as a great tool for teaching stories of the Bible to the congregation who couldn't read Latin and therefore could not read the Bible. Beautiful structures emerge that are lacy and ephemeral looking, but structurally quite strong. And here you see uh, the great cathedral of Notre Dame before it burned. And you can see those beautiful flying buttresses and how they're supporting the vault with that pointed arch. I don't know if you can see any, but there's, you can see. So when you see pointed arches, pointed arch, flying buttress, and um, stained glass, you know you're definitely looking at a Gothic cathedral. The next large invention would be the use of the material cast iron. The structure you're looking at right now was the Crystal Palace. It was in England, and it was built in 1855. Cast iron is melting iron and putting it in, into molds with architectural features like, you know, vaults and the, the uh, ribbing for vaults and stuff. The thing with cast iron, though, it's very heavy. It doesn't have any give to it, and it really does rust quite extensively. This structure is no longer in existence. Probably the most famous cast iron structure is definitely the Eiffel Tower. It would be steel frame construction, though, that really changed architecture. Steel frame construction allowed for skyscrapers to develop. Under the guidance of the Chicago School and Lewis Sullivan, the Home Insurance Building was the first large building that was a skyscraper. It had a steel frame. You can't see it because they add the exterior coating of stone. It's the aesthetic they understand. But underneath all this stone is steel. And steel was incredibly strong. The tensile strength was there. And it would lend itself to the modern aesthetic. That aesthetic in architecture started at the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus group wanted to create a style that was obviously not of a region, if that makes sense to you. It was their, their purpose was really to get away from regionalism. They did not want to create anything that said that it was from a certain place. No more ornamentation. The walls no longer had to bear the weight and they could become curtain walls. This led to a distinctive, if you will, generic look. And unfortunately, I, for, in my opinion, uh, it did strip architecture of its regionalism. This is the Seagram's building in New York. You can see that aesthetic from the international style. Not all architects working in the period agree, agreed with this. And in fact, Frank Lloyd Wright, one of the most famous American architects, wanted structures to look like they were built in a certain place. Uh, they had to, for him, reflect the area. Wright was a pioneer in the way he looked at architecture. 
his Falling Waters house was probably is probably one of the most iconic pieces of American architecture. Wright's idea to cantilever the main living space out over neat the over top, excuse me, uh, the stream that ran through the Kaufman property in Pennsylvania led to a house that is just one of the glories of American innovation. Wright was pioneering new ideas about use of land, use of material. I mean, look inside. That's a holy, you know, it's holistic structure meant to reflect the place it's in. His beautiful Guggenheim Museum puts him at the top of American architecture for many, many, many years. Today, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broadacre City is seen as revolutionary as he proposed the doming over a city. I mean, does art reflect life or does life reflect art? I'm always not clear on that. He also is the first person to really think about a mile high structure. And you see that here. While doming over cities has uh, been talked about, I mean, you can go look. This was a proposal about Houston to keep out pollution. That's the main reason. Certainly, Frank Lloyd Wright's ideas haven't fallen out of favor totally because pollution, it causes so many illnesses in humanity. We just can't live through this. We have to create living space that will help us to survive. On both sides here, you can see this is Beijing, by the way. It's terrible. What are we going to do? Architects have, um, you know, approached architecture in a new way. As climate change and global warming becomes, I think, more of a reality for the people who denied it forever. So contemporary trends include reusing materials like containers. Why not? There's many of them out there. Why not make homes out of them instead of just leaving these things discarded and they're just polluting the environment too. Um, this one I thought was interesting. It was an Italian architect's idea. Create floating homes for the rising water. And certainly, if you follow my channel, you know I'm here in South Florida somewhere. <laughs> you know where I'm at. Um, I think about this rising water when I drive down the street and it's flooded because the tide. What are we going to do? Solar is another thing that has become more and more of a topic. Using solar power and integrating it into homes and even retrofitting it into homes could be the solution for many of our energy problems. Architects are thinking about growing spaces for homes. Wonder if because of food shortages you have to grow your own food. There has to be a space. I've seen these plans for vertical farms and for cities. I mean, I think we're experiencing food shortages. I think that um, in today's world, we have to acknowledge that perhaps the baby formula crisis is the first sign of that in America. Power can be generated to in buildings to power them. Dubio Tech experimented with some ideas. This is in Dubai. And of course Dubai has an incredibly forward-thinking view of architecture. I think it's just because they're, you know, it's space and placement and they just have other issues. So they're the ones who created these. This is of course an artist rendering. Islands people are still talk about, you know, to build new Better homes, of course, this would be a house. Every house would have waterfront. And they are where, in Dubai, was where the very first, or the very, the largest, I'm, I'm not phrasing that correctly. It's the tallest building in the world. There we go. Let me just say it simply. While Frank Lloyd Wright felt that a mile was attainable, 5,280 feet, the Burj, it was originally called the Burj Dubai. Now it's called the Burj Khalifa. Uh, reaches half that, 2,684 feet. It is the, still the tallest structure in the world. It had a restructure. They had went bankrupt and they had a restructuring. But you can see here a mile. Yeah, it might be a while.
<laughs> or maybe it's just not something that's feasible, especially in the climate we live in. You can see here, in comparison to other structures around it, the Burj is a large building. There it is. There's Frank Lloyd Wright's idea. Again, he's pretty forward thinking for his period. Uh, today, the Burj is iconic. I mean, if someone asked me, would you go to Dubai? I was like, I would go to see the Burj. That's what I'd go. I'd yeah, I wouldn't stay in it. I don't even know if they still have a hotel. They did for a while. But you can see how tall it is. Here's the curvature of the earth. The view from the top on a cloudy day. This guy who was doing some images up there. It's a drone. It's an amazing building. It shows you what men can achieve and men and women can achieve if they desire. The Burj at New Year's Eve is supposed to be spectacular. So think about that. The next place is going to be space. What's architecture going to look like in space? That's the next question. I hope you enjoyed my lecture. Those of you who need it, make sure that you take notes for exams because remember, I have assigned this video. I hope everyone has a great day. Peace out. I'll talk to you soon.